We think we are different from the world. What about how we discipline our children? I want to speak to you about that subject. From the perspective of not that I think you're doing a horrible job as I look and from my perspective, having raised my children and I don't have any uh, you know, children to raise and grandchildren seem to be doing okay, that I'm seeing problems. I'm not. A lot of times there's judgments involved, things that are involved that I'm not aware of. But I do know the Bible regarding the discipline of children. I'm not ashamed of what the Bible teaches. I offer it as encouragement to those of you who are different from the culture we live in. They recognize that discipline is necessary, and I think from God's Word, I don't know of anybody that doesn't think this, even if they don't take on what God says about discipline. A child left to himself causes shame to whom? His mother. I think there are a lot of people that would say amen to that. But you'll notice there's a conjunction there before that statement, that brings shame to the one who gave you birth. And there's something connected with that, and we might say, reproof gives wisdom. And it does. Therefore, I'm just going to reprove my child, because I'm not going to leave that child to himself for his destruction. He doesn't know which way to go. He needs some guidance. And so I'll reprove him. I will, there'll be a kind, loving rebuke. I will penetrate into his mind or her mind. And that will give wisdom of how one should live. But the passage doesn't read exactly that in its entirety. God's word says the rod and reproof. Give. See, that's the idea of taking the plural, give, that one thing gives, is the rod and reproof, give, both of them together, give wisdom. The rod, not in our culture today, will take your children away. You're not a good parent. And I'm here to give you encouragement that we take all of what the Bible says. His word is truth. And I want us to realize that the rod and reproof give wisdom, but if you leave your child to, your, to his own devices, destruction happens. And it's a shame to the parents that brought you in to this world. And I want us to look at discipline that God reminds his disciplined children to remember. In Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 3 through 13. You've already heard it read very well by Jimmy. But I want us to see what he reminds us of, because he's reminding the people that have been enduring pain, enduring persecution. From the 10th chapter, they've had their property taken. They're going to jail. They're going through great persecution. Oh, you haven't resisted unto blood yet. But in chapter 11, look how many people of faith suffered pain for the cause of God. Chapter 12 opens up. You have so great a cloud of witnesses. We lived that life. We went through that difficulty. Now look to your Jesus, who is the author, the perfecter of the faith. Look what he went through. He resisted the blood. You haven't done that yet. But you need to be reminded about discipline. And I think it would be good for us, raising our children as parents, to look in what God reminds his disciplined child. And maybe we can incorporate some points when we have to discipline our child, yea, with the rod and with reproof. There are five major divisions in these verses that I want to examine. Number one, the exhortation from ch chastening and the scourging has been forgotten. They, they need to be reminded because they don't get it. 
They don't understand what's happening. They're going through pain. They understand that. They're going through the difficulty. They, they've been experiencing that. But they don't understand what it's about and what they should learn from that. Consider them that have endured such gainsaying of sinners. That's Jesus. Consider him against himself that you wax not weary, fainting in your souls. You've just been disciplined, not killed. I don't want you to grow weary, fainting in your souls. You've not resisted in the blood, striving against sin. That's the fact. And here's the second fact. And you have forgotten, you have forgotten the exhortation which reasoneth with you as sons. Was that our last fishing trip and we got together and had a good time? We talked? Father and son? No. It was the chastening. Was Jesus kind of went through that as he's been examined by the authorities? And scourging? That's what you do when you flog somebody. You take a whip. You take a lash. You take some instrument, Rod. And that word is found in scripture that way. Those are pretty strong terms. But it won't kill you because it's ministered by a father who loves you. But you've forgotten what it meant to be chastened, to feel the pain of the scourge. You've forgotten it. That's what Hebrews 12 says. And therefore, I need to remind you about it, God says. He then says what he means by this. And he takes it from Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. My son, regard not lightly the chasing of the Lord. You've forgotten and don't ever consider it lightly. Don't you despise it? Don't you bring it down to a lesser state? Don't despise it and don't faint. Don't think you're, you're nobody. That I must brought to nothing. Discipline doesn't do that. Don't faint when thou art reproved of him. That's what we see here as being what has been forgotten. What that means to the person that's been disciplined. Don't regard it lightly. That means have little regard for it. And don't faint when you're being reproved. Don't you despise it and don't you grow weary and dis discouraged. Because of discipline. They seem to be taking it out as if maybe they're going to lose their faith. Maybe they're going to be no longer persecuted by the Jews. They're going to become more like the Jews instead of standing as a Christian. And they've gone through the difficult times of being in jail and being having their lands confiscated confiscated in their property. That's the chastening of the Lord. That's the reproof of the Lord. Notice he says, you have forgotten the exhortation. Don't faint at being reproved. Don't regard lightly that chastening. Notice what he has reproved in the context of ex ex exhortation. How many times do we say, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, where to preach the word, be urgent in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. That means it's two-thirds negative and one-third positive. No, it's all positive. Reproof is positive. Rebuke is positive. Reproving is in the context of exhortation with God. And that's who I love. I love his word. I pass that up sometimes because I get in my mind exhortation is coming up the side of person and just encouraging them on, giving them an uplifting word of kindness. And it, it does that. But God says reproving is exhortation. And you've forgotten what that was all about. This may be hard for you to take. 
It's not that God allows it. God does it. He's not setting aside with somebody else doing that to you. You've forgotten I've been doing that to you. For whom the Lord chasteneth, he does it. He does the chastening. He scourges every son whom he receiveth. Verse 10, for they need a few, few days that the fathers of our flesh, and the flesh chasten and seem good to them. But he, God, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. He chastens us. God does it. God brings pain in our lives for training. You may not believe that. I think the passage establishes it. The context establishes it. I know God used Assyria as a rod to bring forth nations down and to bring them up and, bring, and establish them. Understand that. But in this context, he's like God's the father and the, his people, are, Christians, are being persecuted. He doesn't say, I just allowed it to happen. I did it. I'm your father. You've forgotten what it means. Because I chasten, I scourge, but I'm reasoning with you as sons because I will chasten that son I love. And I'll scourge the one that I received. Discipline's not driving you away. Don't let that happen. It's not going to kill you. Don't grow weary in it. Understand that I'm working in your life a pain at this time as a loving father. And it is encouragement to you. You need to know that because you've forgotten what that's all about. And then to further prove his point that he loves them, even though he's chasing them, it is for chasing that you endure. What does that mean? Well, you've gone through it. You haven't died yet. <laughs> You're going through difficulties, lost a few possessions, been in jail for a few days. You haven't resisted the blood yet, like Jesus has. But it's for chasing that you endure. Is he saying that you're alive and it's for chasing because I haven't killed you? at this time, that you're, that you're enduring? Or is it that you're enduring so you can learn the lessons from being chastened? It's for chasing that you endure. But what he wants them to know, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not chasten? There's the question. Who has a father? that does not chase. On the surface, I don't think a lot of them. But the true father. Who has a father that does not chase it? And he gives the other side of this. And we, it says, it does not chase it. If you're without chastening, whereof all have been made partakers, you all have been through that, because I spend my chastening of you. Everybody's been through it. But if you have not been, you have been through, then you are illegitimate children. That father doesn't feel like you belong to them. That's why they're not disciplined. When children are left to themselves to go their own way, and we do not discipline, we don't really care about them. The true father chastens. God says, I'm the true father. I'm doing it to you. I want you to know that. Don't forget it. And it's further proof that I will chasten the child I love. I will scourge the one that I received. You belong to me still. I'm receiving you. But you need to remember what all this means. Thirdly, 
What it does, it works together to produce life and holiness. Verse 9 and 10, Furthermore, we have the fathers of our flesh to chasten us, the true fathers that live up to the responsibilities, and we gave them reverence. Now, how much more when God's doing the scourging now? How much more, rather, shall we be in subjection to the Father of our spirits, not the flesh, our spirits, and live? For they indeed for a few days chasten as seem good to them. They're having to raise their kids. They got a general area you know, to raise them up in the Lord. How they go about doing that seemed good to me. I think it would profit profit them but it seemed good to me he said I want to do things that are profitable to you but he for our profit the disciplined ones profit that ye may be partakers of his holiness see that's the glory of God that's what we're looking forward to enjoying in heaven one scene one scene one scene right after another it will come before our face how holy you are I'm glad I got it down here and living a life that's separated from sin unto you, O oh God. And I realize you've got a plan in discipline. It's to not to show how powerful you are, but it's to show you how holy you want us to be. I'll give you life through the chastening. What well, seemed good to your parents? How are you going to do that? But he did it for our profit. See, profit means I'm working things together. And the discipline and the chastisement, yea, the scourging, is coming together for our benefit, the disciplined one. So we can live and we could prepare be partakers of God's holy character. You seem to have forgotten that. But that's why I chasten you. Oh, I know it's painful. Presently, it's grievous. Presently, it's causing you pain. I understand that. But here's the design. Yet afterward, it yields this peaceable fruit. I'm going to be partaker of his holiness. But verse 11, all chasing seems for the present to be not joyous but grievous. But afterward, it yieldeth peaceable fruit unto them that have been exercised thereby, even the fruit of righteousness. What person that's ever been disciplined by their parent would say, the first part of that sentence is a lie. It's not so painful. I think I've seen some stubborn little boys that said, you didn't hurt me, Daddy. They're not going to shed a tear. But it hurts. It hurts. And God's delivering that hurt? I know it hurts. But I'm right there in it. As a loving father, because afterwards it yields peaceable fruit, not only maybe to help you get along in this world a little bit, but apparent, more importantly, helps you get along with God. You can have peace with God and be a partaker of His holiness, and the peaceable fruit is righteousness. God's standard of righteousness. And God was trying to get his people to, to realize through the re rebuke that he's given through the Hebrew writer himself and the words that he's presenting in that letter. While they are falling away in their progress of being right before God and all the things that are happening to them, they needed to realize from God's perspective is to bring you about to understand that there's peaceable fruit at the end. You've been exercised thereby. And it brings forth peaceable fruit. 
The fourth one is interesting to me. The more you look at it, I was taking it when I have read that before in a different way than I do now. Lift up the hands that hang down and the palsy knees. Those are knees that are very weak. And the hands that hang down and make straight paths for your feet. Whoa, he's talking to me. That's been disciplined. I thought I was supposed to help my brother. I was supposed to pick up his hands. And when he's weak, I'm going to be there to pick him up. That's true. But he's talking to me who's just been disciplined. My hands are down. It hurts. My knees are weak. I want to relax them and not take another step. Relaxing. That's what the feeble knees. I'm quitting. But you make your paths for your feet, you make them straight. When you have a dislocated bone, and you have a broken bone, and you have to get things right, you set it. And what would be the path? We need to go straight. We need to go straight so that you can be totally healed. And he's speaking to the one that's disciplined. Because that which is lame is not turned out of the way. That's why you've been disciplined. That's why things are happening. That you realize I need to get on the straight way. And what happens, the discipline has brought me back from crossing that boundary to the straight path. I can be healed now because my bones have been set. And I know the path. And I'm not relaxing my knees. I'm bending them. Lifting up my hands. Got my leg in a cast and all the bones are straight. I'm here to not forget any longer the chasing of the Lord. That's God speaking to his children. After he has scourged them. After he has chastened them. After he has reproved them and said this is positive. Exhortation. Do we have that mindset, parents? I hope so. We'll come back to this at the end. But you know that rod business is still bugging me. Because we realize now in our society, in our culture, that's not what you do in raising your children. Sweden, back in 79, started a campaign, spare the children. And they were the first to outlaw corporal punishment, any type of spanking. They outlawed because we got to spare the children. We live in a culture that doesn't care about what God thinks about things. We live in a culture that doesn't even have a God in the plans. Especially how I'm going to raise my children. And yet we need to be reminded, if you spare the rod, you hate your son. That's what God says. I don't hate my child. Yeah, you do. It's as if he's just illegitimate to you because you don't understand what your responsibilities are. I love him. I sure don't beat him. No. But in that same context, but he who loves chastens him. Oh, once a year. Be times. Consistently, often when it's needed. That's Proverbs 13, 24. I'm not ashamed of it. And we may live in a time I'll go to jail for it. But parents, when you discipline your children with spanking, and that has its own details. I mean, there's, 
a fatty part of their body, on their bottom, and sometimes on the thigh, and gearing it for the child, you're not there to kill them, it will bring a little pain. But I want to encourage you, you love your child from God's perspective. You desire his destruction? You want to set your heart on his destruction? Well, no, I wouldn't do that. Then chasten thy son, seeing there is hope. Proverbs 19, 18. See how positive it is? Yes, it's painful to him that is disciplined. But I've got hope for you. We can do better. This, act, this action's got to change. And if we start sparing the rod, here is part of God's wisdom that we just leave out. Why? Because our culture frowns upon it. You might think that the rod's not effective in God's use of it. Is using the rod effective? Well, Proverbs twenty two fifteen says it drives foolishness. The foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. That can be a very young child. Up to adolescence, the Hebrew word denotes. And notice, it is bound. Foolishness is bound in the heart. Oh, who would ever reach into there? Loving discipline opens it up, and not only opens it up, it drives it far from that child. Because that activity brings hurt to me. Because I have a loving parent that's not out to kill me. But it's out me to be better. I want to tell you, that's a powerful statement by God. You think the rod is not effective? Our problem is not, it's not effective. We don't think like God. And we don't really care to think about like he thinks about. It delivers a soul, a child from death. It delivers him from Sheol. And yet, that's not, that's verse 14. Verse 13, if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Well, yeah, he will if you beat him long enough. Yeah, he will if you beat him hard enough. Yeah, if he will, you just tear him apart, you big old man and big old woman, and he's just a little bitty guy, and she's just a little bitty girl. Yeah, you can kill because things are abused doesn't mean the rod is not effective for God's cause. He won't die. You haven't resisted to blood yet, but for chastening, you endure. And God, who is administering that, at this particular time in this chastisement, was trying to realize, I love you. I'm delivering you from the foolishness that might bring a death. As we saw in Proverbs 29, 15, what goes together? You don't think the rod's effective? Rod and reproof gives wisdom. To whom? The child. And correction will give you, parents, rest. And you'll delight in your child. Proverbs 29 and verse 17. You think the rod is effective in bringing happiness to parents and as they raise their children? To go through those moments that we find are very difficult. God doesn't outlaw spanking. Man has. And I may be speaking to people that have been affected by this culture. You know better how to raise your children. You may know better than I do. But I'd like you just to consider God who created you. God who knows you. Who knows human nature. 
when you're struggling to find out how am I going to raise my children, don't throw his word out. Embrace it. Put it in its context. God does know best. And he says spanking's pretty good. Not beating to a pulp, breaking their arms, cracking their ribs, abuse. See, if anything's like that, then every part of discipline, that is corporal punishment, is outlawed. But I want to speak about the benefits of spanking. How dare you? Well, I dare. Do you know something? When spanking takes place, it gets their immediate attention. Have you noticed that? We're, we're, located, we're, we're together. Sometimes they may ignore all your warnings. But one thing that happens, even with a very young child, that discipline, that little spanking, we may as, as see mothers sometimes spanking their little hands, getting the point across, it gets their attention. They're ready to listen. It also gives weight to your words. You give them the warnings. Here comes the discipline. And I mean what I say. And spanking is involved in, it gives weight to those words. Spanking does that. It humbles a child, and a child wants to avoid it. <clears throat> oh yes, there's humility that takes place. And a child wants to avoid it. They're not able to think and Reasoning terms like they will as, as we get in high school or junior high. So at a very young age, it communicates in an effective way that the boundaries have been set and they are to be respected. Because when you went outside of that boundary, whatever it was, writing on the walls, we don't tolerate that in our house. You went across the boundary, here's where you need to understand that. And they may not be able to rationally think, well, what's the problem with colors on the wall? Why is he all upset with that? They'll understand this is painful when I do that. And at a very young age, you're communicating. That's what you want to change. Spanking does that pretty effectively. Not child abuse. The discipline from a loving father it also communicates the importance of obeying mommy and daddy. So they could be prepared to obey God. And realize that God has given them the authority to raise them so they could be having the character that God would be pleased with. This is where parents need to work together. Let's just say it gets to the point that the discipline with spanking is not going to be effective as well with my older teenage son or teenage daughter. But one day they can sass at their mother. One day they can disrespect her. And you hear it, daddies? And you can come to her aid because she may be just ready to cry and sob. That ain't going to happen. And she's not going to glee with victory when the daddy grabs his arm and says, you're not going to talk to your mother that way anymore. She doesn't sit there and say, hey, I got you. She's not in competition with the, with the boy or with the girl. And she's not weeping and losing it all and she's so upset. Discipline is happening. Oh, he didn't spank him. He didn't abuse him. But there's the father standing with the mother, and the mother can say, your daddy is right. That's a powerful message of discipline. And at a very young age, sometimes... They may not be able to rationalize all of that, but they know it hurts. And what I think a lot that we don't think about, when it's done, it's over. It's over. 
the discipline has happened. And those of you who say, well, I'm going to make them stand in the corner. I think you're kind of cruel. How long? Maybe five minutes. And if he stands on one foot, I'm going to make it ten. What does that picture look like? Or, go to your room, you will not have supper. Well, you didn't spank them. But boy, that's going to continue a long time. And that's supposed to be okay? I doubt that's okay anymore. Oh, sit in the chair over there. How long? Well, maybe quite a while. Is that effective? Sometimes it is. But I tell you, spanking got it done. And you got to hold a loving child. I mean, a child is crying. And to communicate to them, it's over. Behavior needs to change. I haven't cast you aside. And it won't be, well... Today he sassed me, and I'm glad you got into him. Tonight we'd like to go out to eat, but I guess, can we invite him to go eat with us? He needs to be thinking about his, what he did today. It's over. And you receive them. You just have to change the behavior. Spanking accomplishes those things. And when you think of it that way, it's not drawn out punishment. Sometimes that could be kind of cruel. And then you restore him, sharing your love for him. Mama still loves you. Daddy still loves you. Hope I'll never have to spank you again. And by the time you raise him, it may be another hundred times that you say that. But you hope you never have to again. And if you are daily teaching them the Word of God, and you're going through the Proverbs, that sees this is expression of love. It is effective in changing the behavior. You need to stay within the boundaries. It's because of, of love. You may have one of these scenes when they write on the wall. First of all, if you've got a lot of kids, you've got to find out who did it. Usually the one that kind of, that was eye level, you probably nailed it. The older ones up here, maybe. Oh, it's right here. I think I know who did that. You get that all worked out. And you talk to him or talk to her. You know. The rule in this house, we don't write on the wall. And you know what daddy has to do? Spanking. Where did they get that? Because you've been consistently doing that. And they know what's coming. And it's painful. But they know every time you get through. Said. So, we cannot allow that to happen in our house. I love you. And you're communicating that to them. I think God knows best. And that's what becomes the case. But there's 53 countries today that have outlawed spanking. There's your culture. That's a rude awakening to me. Sweden was the first in 1979. You know, those nation right there, you know, southeast of, of Greenland. Sweden was the first one. Save our children. But Finland came across in the 80s and then Norway. Norway has been in the, the news in the last few years because they will have parents there. One, a Romanian couple that had five kids. And five kids were taken from their parents for corporal punishment. The government did that. And through the protest worldwide, not too long ago, they released them back to their parents because it got too hot. 
It's not that they were abusive parents. They didn't follow the cultural norms that we don't spank any longer. It is outlawed. And yet, they've done it again. And a lot of times, it's foreign parents that come in to live in Norway. That couple left. They fled Norway when they got their kids back. But it happens, and it continues to happen. What surprises me from our study of Proverbs, that in the year 2000, that little dot here, <laughs> that little dot right there is Israel. They outlawed it too in the year 2000. Why does that surprise me? I thought they loved the Old Testament. Culture. Culture wins out in so many places that we've gotten smarter than God. We don't care about what God thinks. And we think that's barbaric. And therefore, we will take your children away. Now, if you're living in Norway, parents, I know God's word. I've communicated God's word pretty plain this, this morning. What is a Christian to do when you're living in Norway? And knowing what they do with foreign parents that start living there. What would you do? I talk big, but I think I'll go to jail for preaching on spanking. But wonder if I have children at home. And it's not just about me going to jail. It's about the possibility that the state is going to raise my kids. That makes me think again. And while that might not be happening here, there are people that watch you when you discipline your children. Sometimes they're members of the church. In our culture today, it wouldn't be surprised if some people don't like spanking. I encourage you, God does. But we have to be careful. Can it lead to my children being taken away? Can that be lead to the authorities? Yeah, it could. And so when I know what is best, I may not spank my children. In times like this, when I realize the laws are in place, I'll find another way to discipline. It won't be as good. Because I cannot let someone else raise my children that I have the responsibility of doing. But I'll preach that truth. I'm not ashamed of it. But sometimes we have to walk in wisdom in this world. And our goal is to develop the character in our children. That will indeed be godly. I thought when I first was studying Hebrews 12, I thought this would be a, the title, the goals of godly discipline. That this is what uh, we want to accomplish, and, and there, in a sense that's true. But as you get into it, it's like a father sitting down with a whimpering child after the discipline to talk to them and tell them this is why I've done what I've done. And while you may not have this discussion with your two or three year old, may your discipline have all the parts in it. May you realize that you've forgotten the exhortation. I need to chase and be times because they forget sometime and I won't I don't want them to take it lightly and I don't want them to faint how did I just apply that discipline was I angry was I insulting was I mad that you embarrassed me in front of the people in the mall in the restaurant could they be faint in heart and be discouraged because of how I applied that discipline? No. Because I didn't do it out of anger. 
I know I am not to provoke my children that they be discouraged. Colossians 3.21 I know God placed me as a father to not provoke my children to wrath, but rather bring them up in the chastening. There is the, there's the training. Discipline is part of that, of spanking, all the things we talked about. And the, and the admonition of the Lord. I can bring forth the pains of the discipline without bringing them to wrath. And without them fainting of how I approached the discipline. And you say, Hebrews 12, I got that right. And it needed to be applied. Because I want to make sure they understand it's because I love them. I truly love them. You belong to me. I am given responsibility to prepare you for heaven. It's because I love you. I can communicate that to them through tears that fill the eyes and speak to their heart. I'm shepherding their heart. I'm trying to get through to their heart. And they'll understand that I love them. Yeah, I know it hurts. I know it's grievous for now. But I also know why I did that. I may not communicate that to them. This is my long-range plan. But it stopped this behavior. Because I want to prepare them for the holy character of God. I want the fruits of righteousness, having peace with God. They're going to respect mommy and daddy. And what I did, I made the paths straight. They know how they ought to act. And now they can be healed. That's how God talked to a whimpering Christian after he disciplined them. And he did the discipline. He was not ashamed of telling them, I did it. It's painful. It has a message. Don't forget it. Don't despise it. And don't faint with it and I'll help you. But ladies and gentlemen, when you do that, you won't be killing them when you beat them with the rod. They will know that they love you, that you love them. And maybe 20 years later, they'll tell you thank you. Because you cared about their character. We live in a time where that's not a popular message. In fact, it's resenting. People resent it. But I want to encourage you as parents, because you have some that are at that age. Think about God's ways, how it's done. And realize that God was a loving father. And we sometimes get, get in our mind that God uses pain to teach us. Why is that a heretic? Why is it a heretic when you say that? Hebrews teaches it. And therefore, we need to embrace it and realize, yes, it's painful for a moment. But I tell you one thing, when the discipline is done, it is over. It's forgotten. We can move on because it has been corrected. Till the next time. And you'll be consistent in that. May you be a loving parent. I know a lot of you striving to be that way, and you are. But may we follow God's wisdom. I hope that will be helpful to you. If you're outside of Jesus Christ, maybe you're uh, not a Christian and you have kids. Think about God's wisdom. Think about your conduct. Think about your example. If you haven't obeyed the gospel yet, we encourage you to do so. That's the greatest example you can set for your children, whether you're a father or whether you're a mother. That here is the teachings of the Lord. And God has told me in this lesson that he resisted. He endured the gainsaying of sinners. Of those who did not love God. They killed him. He did that, despising shame. He went to the cross because he loved you. It's that same God who tells you how to raise your kids, tells you, I'm here to save your soul. And if you haven't obeyed that gospel, we're here to assist you. Obey it now as we stand and as we sing.